Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Cash App. Send, spend, save, and invest. No bank necessary. We all shop online, and whenever it's time to check out, we've all seen that promo code field taunt us. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online, 30,000. They range from sites that have tech and gaming products to popular fashion brands and even food delivery. It's great. So here's how it works. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. It's true. I just bought some shirts the other day and Honey saved me 20 bucks. It was actually really easy. So look, if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. So what are you waiting for? Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash old man, all one word. That's joinhoney.com dot com slash old man all right let's welcome in our guest new york nick julius randall julius what's up man what's up what's up man how you doing i'm good i'm good we are good um grinding through this this season we appreciate the time i know you you actually flew in from a road trip earlier today so we appreciate you hopping on with us um as it stands today you guys are in sixth place Mm -hmm. 14 and 16 would you say that the Knicks have have your team has exceeded your own expectations, or did, did did you see this this turnaround season coming? Um, I would say we maybe have exceeded uh, other other people's expectations. Um, I think if you just have been around like our group on a day to day basis, um, we just have a confidence and belief about us. Uh, I mean, and it starts with with Tibbs and everything that he's doing, but you know, we just go about things the right way every day and, uh, you know, building the right habits. So we have a confidence and belief about us every game that we play that, you know, we're going to win the game. So, uh, you know, maybe early on, but, you know, now it's not really coming to us as a surprise when we win games. So, yeah. Tibbs has a, has a certain reputation Mm -hmm. amongst (laughs) the league and amongst players (laughs) I don't want to call it being a hard ass, but he's a hard ass, right? That's his reputation. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and I, I, I look, I play for a guy, Stan, who has a very similar reputation. I played for Stan for five years. There's a, there's a certain expectation of professionalism and diligence about doing your job. Um, what were your sort of thoughts when Tibbs got the job and, and, and how much of, how much of that turnaround this season and, and, and the winning culture is, is directly related to, to what he's brought to the franchise. Yeah, man. Um, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really know much about him. Like I played with, uh, with Luau. So Luau and I played with Booz as well. So they had played, uh, for Tibbs. So, I mean, I talked to them a little bit, uh, but I didn't really know much, much about him. You know, I just kind of wanted to come in with an open mind, um, and, you know, just kind of follow his lead, you know, just be, be a leader of the team and, you know, ask, do whatever you ask of me. Uh, so, you know, I didn't really have, any, uh, you know, preconceived notion of him or whatever. But I will say this about Tibbs, man. Like, uh, he's a tough coach if you <laughs> if you don't like to be coached or if you don't like to if you don't like to play or do things the right way, then he's tough. Uh, but Tibbs, I mean, Tibbs is the type of guy that, uh, you know, he just expects a certain level, like you said, a certain level of professionalism. Uh, he expects you to do things the right way. Uh, be prepared and do things the right way on a day-to-day basis. And if you don't want to do that, then it's going to be tough. Um, so, I mean, we go we go about practice uh, a certain way. We go about shoot-arounds and stuff a certain way. And uh, I respect it. And uh, I appreciate it because, um, you know, early throughout the season, we're seeing the results of, of creating the right habits, doing things the right way. So, I mean, it's dope for me. And honestly, man, he's not as much of a hard ass as people think he is, bro. Like... <laughs> <laughs> the dude is like the dude is super cool, bro. Like you can talk to him, like you know, he really, he really, he gonna kill me if he sees him. He really is soft, man. Like <laughs> you can, you can talk to him. So I mean, Tim's, Tim's is dope, bro. Like he's dope. He's really 
honestly, he's a player's coach. Like this is this is the most fun as far as in the league that I've had playing for sure. What do you what do you think it is about uh, some of the young guys on this team in particular that have that has allowed them to be successful with him? Because that's definitely been a thing. He's always been a guy that's relied on vets, you know, in his yeah. sort of previous spots. But you guys have a lot of young players who are playing a lot and playing well. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, he's just gonna hold you accountable. And I think the big thing about uh, our young guys is um, they have a certain swagger, a certain confidence about them. Like, uh, and they work a certain way. I mean, if you know one thing about Tibbs, like he loves dudes who, who want who want to work. And you know, when dudes are coming into the gym, like this is the first time I've ever been on a team. Like usually, like when I travel, or I go on the road or something, whatever it is, or I come back at night and shoot. Uh, I'd be the only one, like in the gym at night or I'll be the only one like when we leave and get off the plane like that's going to the gym and getting extra shots up um, you know and this is the first time I've been on a team where we got multiple dudes like damn near the whole team coming to the gym uh, putting in extra work uh, putting in extra shots and Tibbs loves it and you know Tibbs loves guys who are, who are gym rats and who want to work and you know that's like quick you know those guys uh, OB Kev all those dudes they're gym rats man RJ they're, they're gym rats so Tibbs loves that about guys, and uh, you know that just that just installs a certain level of trust in them, even if you are a young player. Are, are you guys practicing? Because not really. Yeah, it's. Ki- <laughs> no. I think it's ki- it's killing Stan right now. Yeah, the, the schedule of like every other day where we have a game. You know, we're coming off. We had a six game and nine stretch, mm-hmm. uh, nine day stretch, and then we're in the middle of another six game in nine day stretch, and it's just like you don't ha- you can't get the reps and. For us, I think what's frustrating is Stan is, you know, he's built his career, a, a large portion of his career, obviously he's won a ton of games and won wherever he's been, but a large portion of his career is he's, he's built great def- defensive teams. Mm-hmm. And we haven't been that, that this year. And a lot of that he's, you know, he feels like is we just haven't got the reps in practice. And it was a, a shortened preseason. And if you guys aren't practicing, I mean, you guys are, I think as of today, I looked it up. I think you're third in defensive rating right now. Um, how are, how are you, how are you guys building that defense without getting those reps in practice? Well, the training camp was huge. I mean, even if it was a short training camp, like, like, uh, we, we said early on, like during the preseason games and even early in the season, we kept saying like, and we knew, uh, we kept saying like our, our, our defense is ahead of our offense. And that was just our theme from, from early on. Like we were winning games uh, on the defensive end. And I'll, I'll say this about uh, just our coaching staff and Tibbs and everything. Like this is probably the, the most like from a game to game. Like I haven't been in the playoffs yet, unfortunately, but from a game to game perspective, like this is the most like detailed and prepared we are on each team like we come in like as far as like scouting report how we're going to game plan against people uh we obviously have our game to game defensive uh, principles and stuff like that but like as far as like the detail and preparation that goes into uh our game plan it's like it's crazy it's second to none and then like uh you, you know we said we don't have practice a lot honestly like we don't practice as much as hard like you said from from uh, playing every other day, like shoot arounds are almost like our practices in a sense. Um, but yeah, the preparation and the, the attention to detail that Tibbs has on stuff is, is, is insane. How, how much have you, have, have you craved that? Cause, cause from the outside and you, you and I don't know each other that well, but yeah. you know, you, you, you've got a reputation as a hardworking player. Mm-hmm. You, you've got a reputation as a guy who plays his ass off and plays hard every night. Yeah. And you haven't been on a playoff team. You haven't been in that winning culture. And I'm not knocking any previous coach you've ever had. Absolutely. But if this is the this is the first time you're really getting that detailed preparation, um, I would imagine it's probably a little bit of an adjustment. But at the same time, it's gotta it's gotta make you happy. Like I would assume you've you've craved that in the last you know portion of your career. Yeah, it's funny, man. Funny story because like when Wes, uh, when we were going through the whole you know, process of like hiring uh, the coaching staff and all that type of stuff. Wes called me, he was like, he's like, what do you need to be, you know, the player that you need to be, what do you need to be to get to that level? And I was like, I need a coach who's going to push me and hold me accountable first off. And, uh, you know, when Tibbs got the job, I thought it was a perfect fit. 
And uh, I mean, like like you said, not to knock any coach that I've had before. Uh, I play for amazing coaches who I still have an amazing relationship with. Lou got an amazing relationship with Alvin uh, and all those guys. Like all those guys were necessary for the time uh, in my career. And uh, for me, I, I I crave like Tibbs is coaching, uh, him pushing me, uh, challenging me. Um, because it, you, I know it's coming from a good place. Like we want to win, and uh, I kind of feel like we're one in the same person. Like we we uh, do the same thing. Like we like to work hard. You know, what I mean, we like to uh, just love the game of basketball, really, man. And uh, I feel like everything from that, what Tibbs is doing, stems from a good place. So I enjoy it. I uh, I've noticed with some of my younger teammates mm. that. <laughs> the the amount of detail I, again Stan and Tibbs very similar the amount of detail and the amount of plays that we go over in shoot around yes, is sir. excessive and as you mentioned <laughs> as you mentioned every coach is a little different one way may be the right way for certain teams one may one way may be the right way for another team whatever and we've I you know I played for Alvin last year you played for Alvin. You know, a, a shoot around in general, we might go over a couple of plays, but a lot of it is concepts. You know, Doc was a, sort of the same way, you know, a lot of concepts, right? Lawrence Frank, when I had him as a defensive coordinator, he was like Stan and Tibbs. You know, we went over everything. Um, but the young guys will come up to me and they'll be like, yo, yo, when you had Stan in Orlando, did you guys go over this many plays? And I'm like, actually... We went over more plays. They were fucking live with knee pads on. <laughs> and it took an hour and a half to get through just the shoot around part. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so it is like, I, I just, I think it's, I think it's so cool to hear you talk about this because, and we, we've talked about this. Like I talked about this, Marcin Gortat, uh, Jameer Nelson, Richard Lewis. Like when you're in it with Stan, it's like, man, this is a lot. But yeah. then when you don't have that, you realize how, how much you appreciated being in that Absolutely, moment. Because yeah. going into every game and feeling prepared, that that's what gives you confidence to play. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. And I feel like, um, you know, like you said, for the younger players uh, on our team, and they, they don't they don't complain. Like, they they go about it great. Like, they, uh, they love it because it's all they know. But for them to have this type of, like, coaching – and like you said, attention to detail, being prepared on a game to game basis to have that early in their career, man, is like they don't understand how much of a blessing it is because you play for multiple coaches in your career. And, you know, I have two and, you know, every coach is different, you know, and they, they adjust to their team. But, you know, to have that type of detail, feeling prepared for every game, I feel like that's part of the reason. Like when I said earlier, when I said earlier, like we feel like we can win every game is because we're prepared. Like, we feel like we know everything that's coming, and we feel like if, um, you know, we, we stick to our game plan and do what we need to do, we're going to win the game. Uh, Julius, going back to your, your rookie year for a second, obviously, you know, you had the injury opening mm -hmm. night, but that aside, you know, from, from a mental standpoint, when did you start to feel like you were you had made the jump? And part of why I asked this is, you know, we're talking about winning. Like, you won – a, a ton in high school you go to Kentucky you make the national championship your freshman year you know so you're like guys basically won your whole career yeah. and we've we've talked about this with a few other guys in the show you have that transition to all of a sudden you're like okay now I'm in the I'm in the pros and I'm not winning every night injury aside and I, I want to talk about the injury and we're gonna talk about that but like how did you wrap your head around about around you know that sort of process shit it was tough man uh and, you know, the thing about the NBA is, man, you're playing so many games that you don't have time to, to you know, complain or whatever it is about one game. You got to move on to the next. So uh, it was tough, man. It was a tough adjustment. And anybody who, who knows me that's around me, I'm super competitive. So, like, uh, like I can be like, like, I can't hide my emotions very well <laughs> in a sense. So, like, if something bothering me, you're going to know. And like I had to learn how to mature and, and really grow past that, and uh, so I mean it was tough, man. It, it, it was definitely a tough transition, not winning all the time when you, when you first entered the pros for sure. Let's talk about your injury. Yeah, fourteen minutes into your rookie year, you you break your leg. Right. 
There was a, a really good article a couple days ago in the uh, in the in the New York Times uh, about you. There's a little anecdote that says you had no doubt you would return. Mm-hmm. But what's going through your mind in those first few moments as you're getting taken off the court, you're going back to get x-rays, you get the news. Obviously, you probably knew what was going on. You knew it was broken. but And, and then you have to wrap your head around this as a rookie. Uh, I mean, I had a good support system, so it really wasn't that hard between my uh, my girlfriend but my wife now. Uh, my mom was around. So, like, I had a good support system. Um and, you know, the injury was crazy uh, just because, like, I was experiencing, like, pain, like, that whole, like, summer training camp in my leg. And I didn't know, like, what it was, like, what was going on. So, like, I broke my leg and, like, I was like, ah, okay, this is, this is what's going on. <laughs> uh, but, damn, it was too late. But, uh, yeah, so um, I really didn't have any doubt just because it was bone. Um and, you know, when I talked to the doctors and stuff, as soon as I got there, they'd be like, you'll, you'll be fine. Like, you're out for the year, uh, but you'll make a full recovery. So I didn't really have any doubt. It was more just uh, just the rehab in the beginning. And then uh, the only thing that was really, like, weird or, like, challenging was when I first started to run again. Um, and I was putting that pressure and that force on that bone. Uh, it was tough. So I, had, um, I was around the time my agent, he was representing Paul. Uh, PG, and he had went through a similar injury. Um, so I, I reached out to him and I talked to him. He was like, yeah, you just got to push through it, man. You got to push and, you know, just get used to putting that pressure back on that leg. So uh, that was really the only challenging part for me. Um, and then once I got past that, it, it was honestly easy, man. It wasn't it wasn't too much. I've always, I've always said this about injuries, and I've been fortunate. I mean, I've had a, a couple – I get somewhat serious injuries, but nothing like a broken leg or a knee or anything like that. Knock on wood. Yeah, you got Knock it. on wood. Um, but you know, the, it, it's, it's that first part when you get cleared. Mm. Yeah. That's the hardest part. Cause mentally <laughs> there's like this trigger where you're like, I'm doing the movement or I'm, I'm following the biomechanical pattern yeah. of when the injury occurred and your like brain just doesn't want to like make your body work the right way. Yeah. And you, you really do have to like push through that. I mean, I've had, you know, hamstring injuries, for instance, you know, those are like, there's two or three days where like, you're, you're good to go. You clear, you can do whatever you want. And I'm like, can I, yeah, can I? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. I'm it's not sure body. that I can, is my body going to function right? Um, yeah. <laughs> but I can't, I mean, look, I can't imagine, I, you know the the coming back from from that and 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 those whether it was days or weeks that 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 mental block that must have happened. Yeah, man, it was uh it was tough. Like like really the first part of like right after surgery uh was tough because I'm in the bed. I'm like, damn, I just broke my leg my rookie year. Like, what the hell? And um, you know, I, I get out of surgery and uh, they come to my room that night and they're like, all right, you gotta walk. And I'm like, what? Like, it was like, what you mean I got to walk? <laughs> and um, they give me a walker. I'm like, bro, what does my life come to? So they <laughs> give, give me a walker. And um, I'm literally, man, I'm trying to put pressure on this leg. This is not even 24 hours after surgery. I'm trying to put pressure on this leg. And the pain, this is the pain like I've never felt. Like when I broke my leg, I didn't feel anything. That night, I didn't feel anything. Like I was fine. But the pain of walking on my leg right after surgery was like something I don't wish on anybody. And uh, like, I'm just crying, like I'm in tears. I'm like, bro, what is going on? Like, unreal. I'm like, bro, this is, that's probably when I probably had a little doubt. I'm like, man, am I gonna come back for this? <laughs> and um, yeah, they made me like every day. Cause they said like, you have to get blood flowing in your leg or you can get like blood clots and stuff like that. So every day, like my leg is huge. They're making me walk on my leg. And, uh, I mean, that was really the tough part being kind of like basically handicapped, like you're not being able to move around and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, I got past that eventually a couple months I got past that. Uh, but it definitely was weird. Once I finally got on the court and I'm taking jump shots and I'm running and stuff. Yeah. It it felt weird. Like it was, it definitely felt foreign. This is not a one up. I want to be very clear. I was not a one up because I did not have a very serious injury like you. But I have a similar story in that my one surgery I had, 
I tore two abdominal muscles and one of them had like ripped off my pubic bone. Yeah. And so I played in the playoffs and then I got surgery after the season and I'm coming out of anesthesia. I didn't do well with it. I had an allergic reaction to Demerol and they took me back to the, um, the, uh, hotel and they made me immediately get on a plane. So I'm, I'm literally getting a wheelchair through Philadelphia airport and then land in Orlando, get wheelchaired to the car or whatever. And they, they were like, you got to walk like right away. And I can't like, I'm hunched over, you know, they, they've constricted my adductors and my, my lower abdominal muscles. So I'm hunched over like this. They're like, you got to try to walk like half a mile. So I walked out my front door and I walked half a block. And I was like, <laughs> fuck this. <laughs> like, I'm not I'm going back to bed, man. This yeah, is man, ridiculous. That, pain, that, pain, that, surgery, that, that medicine wore off, bro. It's, yeah. Um, That's tough. That's tough. You're you're having you're having a career year, and you're you're averaging career highs in rebounds, points, assists. You're leading the Knicks in points, rebounds, and assists. Um, how much of your game and your success this year is based on whether it's Tibbs or personnel, and how much of it is just you getting better and and your own progression as a player? Yeah, man, I think. Uh it's all just coming full circle. Like every year, um, you know, I go into the off season, like I, I love the off season because it's really a chance for me to improve uh, and work on my game. So I, I really crave it and, and look forward to it. Um, but it all really came full circle, man. It was that, uh, it was the extended break. Like we didn't play for nine months or whatever it is. So like, I really got to like dig in and really, you know, get better. Um, and then it was, it was a combination of Tibbs uh, coming in and, and the, coaching staff with, with Kenny Payne, like being familiar with him, like, and, and a person who really knows me. Uh, I mean, all of that, man, like uh, all of that, you know, kind of worked together and it's really, uh, you know, worked to my benefit, but, you know, I just, I just, um, I just always enjoy like, the, like I said, the off season, man. And uh, last year was a huge learning experience for me as a player being put in a position for the first time uh, in my career. And to be able to, um, you know, come back and, and learn from that and get better. Uh, you know, I kind of really, um, you know, took, took that on and really wanted to get better from that. Tommy, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, new year, new you. I have. But have you ever heard the phrase, new rear, new you? No, explain. Well, in 2021, don't just make a commitment to wash your hands every time you poop. Go the extra mile and wash your butt too. Yeah, that's right. The future of toileting has arrived. It's technically been around for centuries, but hideously expensive, costing thousands. But now the brand new Hello Tushy 3.0 Modern Bidet Attachment is here to level the playing field. It's stylish, eco-friendly, easy to install, and affordable. Hello Tushy 3.0 doesn't just cleanse your butt with a precise stream of fresh water. It cleans itself before and after it's used with the Smart Spray, trademarked, automatic self-cleaning nozzle that's right jj it attaches to your existing toilet requires no electricity or additional plumbing and cuts toilet paper use by 80 percent eight zero so the hello tushy bidet pays for itself in just a few months because with hello tushy you don't wipe at all just poop spray dry and go Plus, every Hello Tushy Bidet attachment comes with a 60-day risk-free guarantee and a 12-month warranty. So don't wait. Go to hellotushy.com slash three to get 10% off plus free shipping. And remember, this is a special offer for our listeners. Please spell out three, T-H-R-E-E, hellotushy.com slash three for 10% off. That's hellotushy.com slash three. And I'd like to add, we had someone on social media send us a picture of their Hello Tushy. So if when you get your Hello Tushy, tag us, JJ Reddick, T. Alter, uh, Old Man and the Three, and we'll repost your Hello Tushy. We will indeed. Are you are you aware of like on Twitter? There's certain guys that um, it's like called like Island or Hill. Like I'm like 
Dion Waiters Island, Julius Randall Island. Like I'm willing to die on this island. Like I, I still think there's something there with this. I'm not giving up on this player. Like, are you aware of that at all? Have you ever heard yeah, anything like that? Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> I, I feel like for you, there's got to be a little bit of like vindication here with the season you're having. Um, because look, we're all critiqued in a certain way. Yeah. Um, and you know, you're, you're playing at an all-star level. There's all-star buzz about you right now. And I, I would, I would assume there's a certain level of vindication you feel with, with how this season is going. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like I, I went through it last year. Uh, you know, I, like, you know, the losing, uh, feel like I'm not playing my best basketball, uh, you know, and, and there's no, I don't care what nobody say, there's no tougher place to play than here in New York. Like, uh, just from a perspective of just it being with the media, with, you know, the fans who really know the game and love the game, uh, it's a tough place to play. So, um, you know, and anybody who really loves the game of basketball is going to be sensitive about their craft. Uh, so, you know, I, I was sensitive to it. Like, I, I really wanted to get better. And, uh, you know, whatever it is, prove any doubt around my name wrong. Like if you look at the progression of my career each year, I feel like I've gotten better. Um, so I, I want to continue that. And uh, for me, I just took it personal. I took it as a challenge, you know, to to come in and be a much better player than I was. Um, and I feel like I did that, you know, for me on an individual level. Um, and then it just kind of, you know, magnified uh, bringing in tips and, you know, the coaching stuff. What's the what's the MSG no fan experience been like? It's different, man. <laughs> it's definitely different. Like you go to, I ain't like I'm not gonna knock anybody's arenas, but <laughs> you go to certain places, man, and like we can like, knock Detroit's. We can knock Detroit's. <laughs> All right, we're saying yeah, knock Detroit's. <laughs> always, always on this show. Every third episode, JJ takes a random stray at Detroit for no reason <laughs> look man like I've played enough April games at the end of a regular season in Detroit where there's like 4,200 people in an 18,000 seat arena all right brand new arena. <laughs> yeah you, you go to certain places man you're like all right you gotta create your own energy like you used to not be a fan uh Madison Square Garden is definitely not a place that you're used to that so it's, it's definitely different uh you know, we get to here in like a couple of days, we get to have fans come back, you know, on a, on a smaller scale. So it'd be cool. But yeah, it's, it's tough, man. But um, I don't know. It's still Madison Square. We're still lucky to play there every night. It, it is what makes the Knicks experience, I feel like, the special, well, one of the special parts. I, playing in New York is, is amazing. And, and obviously, I, I choose to live in New York City in the off season, And, uh, I, I love the city, but Madison Square Garden, since going back to high school, since the McDonald's All-American game for me, has been my favorite arena. And you got to experience it last year. And you also got to experience the New York media. And you you did it in LA too. You know, you 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 played in Staples, you played for the Lakers, you've played for two of the banner franchises in our league. Right. And, and you've had the other side of that too. You know, there, there's like for us in new Orleans, like we don't deal with the same scrutiny that bigger markets do. We certainly don't even really deal with the same scrutiny that maybe the saints do. Exactly. It's nice. It's, <laughs> it's less stressful. It's less stressful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I would say if, if, if you can, if I, Lakers are like, cause Clippers really aren't the same as like the Lakers in terms of, in terms of the media stuff. But you know, if you can, if you can play for the Lakers, the Knicks, probably Philly, yeah. and the Celtics, yeah. and deal with all that comes with that. I, you can play for anybody. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And that was uh, for me. I, that was a big like decision of why I kind of like chose the Knicks because it was I came from from LA and I played there for four years, and then I experienced the complete other side going to New Orleans, and um, you know it was just a lot more laid back and chill. And uh, you know when I had the opportunity. For one, it was the Knicks. Uh, Madison Square was always my favorite arena to play in. But when I had the opportunity, uh, you know, to go to a bigger market again, like I wanted that experience. Like I wanted to get that experience again. So, uh, and I knew how to handle it better uh, just coming from LA. Like I had that experience. So 
um, you know, it was kind of no brainer for me. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, be in that type of market, that type of situation. What's your feeling looking back now at some of, some of your, some of the old Laker teams and some of your teammates, a few of whom are JJ's teammates right now, you know, and, but, but Jordan and Utah, you know, D'Angelo obviously has had a lot of success since leaving LA. Like there was a lot of talent on that team. Obviously, you know, you're still friends with these guys and you're happy for these guys, but what's your kind of feeling in retrospect, looking back at like the, some of those groups that you had? I mean, you can't knock LA. I mean, they won the championship. So <laughs> they got us all up out of there, honestly, but <laughs> ended up working out the best for them. They got, they got another banner, but, uh, I mean, if you, I don't know how it all would have played out uh, and how we all would have developed together. Um, obviously, we, we all went our own separate ways and kind of shine on our own and in our own, you know, in our own way. But uh, I mean, you really put those pieces together, man. That's a hell of a team uh, with you know Alonzo and D'Angelo and Brandon and Jordan, me, uh, Larry Nance. Like that's a, that's a lot of guys. So uh, I mean. It'd be a good team. Josh, Josh, <laughs> it'd be interesting to see how that really would have <laughs> would have played out for sure. Uh, for our YouTube viewers, uh, just a reminder that uh, I'm doing this in Josh Hart's um, <laughs> video game room <laughs> slash infrared sauna room. He still play video games all day. He literally played today. Today was an off day. He played for like two hours before he got a massage. Like the, the dude is just like living the life. <laughs> he just messaged me. I'm not gonna say what he said though, but he just messaged me. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about your three point shooting specifically because this is a skill set that you develop. You're you're shooting over forty percent this year on a, on four and a half attempts a game, which is fairly high volume. Um. How 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 did you develop that? And when when was at what point in your career did you kind of say like, oh, I can actually be a stretch big, like I can shoot well enough to to have this be a weapon? Yeah, I really didn't start shooting threes until I got to New Orleans. I was and I really wasn't shooting it that much. Um, but when I when I signed there, they were like, yo, uh, they came and watched me work out or whatever, um, and it was like, yo, you need to shoot threes. Like uh, they just looked at my form, my technique. They were like, yo, you can shoot threes. So that kind of clicked for me and I really worked on it that summer. And I, you know, I shot decent. I shot like 34% that, that season. Um, and then the off season I came back and I worked, I worked hard at it and I just didn't shoot the ball well. Uh, and, you know, um, like I said, going into the break, um, when our season had got cut short, I went back home, uh, you know, working my trainers, fix some things, uh, technique really it was more of my footwork and stuff like that. And I just repped the hell out of it, man. Like it would be times I'd go to the gym. And I get a thousand makes and like it was just, you know, something that I wanted to get better at. And, uh, you know, I just I just tried to rep it, rep it as much as I can. And uh, I had a long period of time to do so. And, um, you know, this season I came in and, you know, that's the thing about coaching, man. Like coaches can <laughs> they can they can kill you or they can give you the most confidence in the world. Um, and that's kind of like what Tibbs did. He gave me extreme confidence. Like every time he saw me uh, work out, saw me shoot, he's like, man, your shot looks beautiful. Like you have great art, you have great spin, all that type of stuff. And, you know, you know, just the confidence is there. Um, and then, you know, you also get confidence from the work you put in. So uh, it's just something that, you know, I'm fairly confident doing it over the course of my career, just year in, year out, putting, putting the work in, um, you know, it's all coming together. This, this is something we've stressed a ton on the show. Tommy, you can back me up on this. But I always say about about great scorers and great shooters, footwork is the key. Absolutely. And, and you know, be, being able to sort of master your footwork in these imperfect environments, on the move, uh, off the dribble, all that stuff is, is very hard. Did you, work with, did you work with Fred Vincent when you were here in, in New Orleans? I didn't work with Fred much. Uh, okay. AD worked with him a lot. I didn't work with Fred much, but uh, Fred does a lot of good stuff. Like just from what I've seen, he does a lot of good stuff. Um, he's been amazing for Lonzo. Yeah, and he he started working with Zion a few weeks ago, and Zion's free throw shooting. He's shooting it well from free throw. Is, free is high seventies right now? I think yeah. since he started working with Fred, and he's uh, he's knocked down a few threes. Like it, I I bring up Fred's name. Because he's one of the unsung heroes in the NBA, and Absolutely. as as much as as some of the gurus get talked about, 
Um, he really is a a just a master at his craft as as a as a shooting coach. He's he's one of the best I've seen. Yeah, he's he's really good, man. He's super he's super detailed. Like I remember when I first got there, he was working with AD on his uh, three point shot. You know, he was filming it and you know going through things and showing him like different footwork and technique stuff. Uh, I worked more with Kev uh, Kevin Hansen when I was there, but um, yeah, I didn't really uh, get to work much with Fred. But yeah, Fred's really good. Were there specific? I think you've talked about this in a couple of interviews that we were reading before this, but were there specific footwork things you, you took from Kobe from being around him? Uh, yeah, it was definitely certain things, uh, you know, when I would work out with him that he did. Uh, what's up, Papa? Sorry, my son's here. Uh, yeah, it was definitely, uh, definitely things that I took from Kobe, um, that, you know, I, I learned from him. Um, and honestly, man, like a lot of stuff that he told me, I kind of like really already knew because uh, I work, I, he was my idol. So I, everything I did, like I watched him so uh, meticulously and, and just really, really study him. Um, so I learned a lot from him. Um, and then unfortunately, you know, he passed away and it even made me more dig into his film more and really just study his footwork and his body position and how he got you know, around the court and, and create an easy scoring opportunity. So yeah, I definitely learned a lot from it. Julius is is um is that the is that the viral superstar? It is. It That's is. Ki- Titan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up? <laughs> what so for those that don't know, there's a viral <laughs> video of him playing uh I guess peewee basketball yeah. and uh one of his teammates gets gets into a precarious situation. Yeah. on the sideline and decides <laughs> he doesn't want to give the rock up You're right. and your son <laughs> goes over and tackles, <laughs> tackles his own teammate. Yeah, man. He, uh, <laughs> you know, what's crazy about this situation is, um, so that was like his best friend, like back in Dallas, that's like probably like his best friend or whatever. But what's crazy about the situation is man, like it happens once a game. So he's doing it at least once a game. Like when he's gonna tackle somebody in practice, he's gonna tackle somebody. Uh, he's just aggressive like that because we we play around and I, I'm aggressive with him, whatever it is, and we we tackle and have fun and all that type of stuff. But it, it happens once a game. It just so happened that my wife caught it on camera that game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, it went viral. That was funny though. It was funny. What what's his explanation of why he's doing that? Uh, he said he wouldn't pass on the ball. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was, it I love was it. Much, it was pretty much as simple as that. He hadn't got a bucket all season long, so he was he was going to score. <laughs> well, we, we, Julie, when you were growing up, what was it? Was it similar? Uh, I don't think I tackled anybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think I got I got to that point, but. Uh, you know, I can, I probably can say that he watches me play, so he definitely gets his aggressive nature and style of play from me, probably. So <laughs> he's like, yo, you don't want to pass me the ball, I'll go get it. <laughs> so I, I wanted to I wanted to just kind of touch on Kobe's last year. Yeah. Um and and what your your memories from that season were in, in watching him. Man, it was uh it was an unbelievable experience, bro. Like uh, it was tough, man, because, you know, as a young player, you want to um, you want to develop, you want to grow, you want to learn. And this season really wasn't as far as growing as a player. It really wasn't about that. Uh, I mean, the season was about code. So it was tough in that aspect. And, and then on top of that, it wasn't about winning either. So uh, it was tough in that aspect. Um, but I was so caught up in. Um, just in all of being in my in my childhood hero, like dude, was a superhero, my my favorite player ever, that I really didn't care, and uh, just to experience that type of uh, love that people had for him on a game to game basis, um, it was insane. Like I, I haven't like like Michael Jackson torn or something, bro. It was crazy, bro. It was <laughs> it was nuts. Like the first he had announced that he was retiring in our first away game, it was back in Philly, where he you know he obviously grew up. And like it was like a Laker home game. Everywhere we went, like on the road, was a, a Lakers home game, and uh, it was crazy. Like people crying, like you know, just obsessed with them. So it was fun, like just to experience that. 
And then on top of that, man, dude, he was the greatest teammate, bro. Like he uh, was a complete open book about whatever. Like it wasn't even just basketball. Like it can be business, it can be anything. Like he was a complete open book. So I soaked up so much knowledge and learned so much from him uh, during that experience. Like it was something that, uh, and we developed like a real like relationship, like a real brotherhood. Like he was a big brother to me. So uh, I mean, to have that experience, man, like uh, I wouldn't change it for anything. The game, his last game, <laughs> he dropped 60 on the Jazz. Yeah. You guys weren't going to be in the playoffs. So everybody knew it was his last game. Right. I looked up the box score earlier today. He got 50 jacks up that game. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine? Could you oh, imagine my God. 50 shots in a game. Dude, if I, could, I would love to get 30 shots in a game. <laughs> Actually, at this point, I'd love to get 10 shots in a game, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to imagine – like the conversation, like was it unspoken, or did you guys say to him like Kobe, Kobe, go for it, or did he say, "Yo, I'm shooting every time tonight"? Like, or did it happen organically? He didn't have to. He didn't have to say it. <laughs> he didn't have to say it. It was spoken between us as players. It was like, "Yo, he's getting every shot." Like we knew that. Like we say, "Yo, we pass him on the ball every time." So, and it, it started off rough. Like if you watch the game, like. He, I don't know, he probably, first 15 shots, he probably made two. Like, so we were, we were worried. Uh, but, man, he flipped that switch, bro, and it was like, really, like, it was like one of the few times all season I seen, like, the real Black Mamba come back. It was crazy, bro. Like, he, he just had a certain energy and presence about him. He was, you know, doing the, with his teeth and all that. Like, I'm like, yo, like, dude is going crazy. So, uh, yeah, it was definitely unspoken. It was actually a funny, a funny, hold on, I'm touch that ball. It was actually a funny part in that game because um, he had took the ball out. He had inbounded to me, and I was like, yo, I'm about to come out. I'm shooting this time, whatever. And he was like, yo, MF, like, he was like, if you want everybody in this arena to boo you, go ahead. But you better throw me the damn ball. <laughs> so, I was like, yeah, you know, you're right. And, uh, you know, that was just a funny moment from that game. But, yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely unspoken. And then after he was like, yo, he was like, y'all lucky I'm retiring because he was like, if I was in my prom, bro, this is how it would be every night. You're going to throw me a ball like this every <laughs> every single night. <laughs> so it was dope, man. It was dope. <laughs> oh, man. I love, the, I love hearing these stories about Kobe at the end of his career yeah. when he has the full perspective. Yeah. You know, when he's kind of gone through everything and then he has the injury and then it's like, the appreciation for the game, the appreciation for being a teammate. But yeah, I mean, I, I, like that year he averaged uh, 35 or whatever. Yeah. Like I would imagine that year with that roster, like <laughs> there were nights where you're going in as his teammate. You're like, all right, he's going to shoot every shot tonight. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You got to deal with it. <laughs> you got to deal with it. But uh, yeah, man, it was dope, bro. Like just, it was, and I obviously call him. I played with him with two years. That first year he came back, he was uh I thought I thought he still had juice. Um and obviously I got hurt. Um, but he had came in the training camp, he looked unbelievable and I thought he was ready to go. And obviously he had injuries and you know, Father Tom is undefeated, so uh it caught up with him. But yeah, man, that that just that that experience, man, alone, uh, you know, playing with playing with two four. Uh, during that time, bro, was it was crazy because, I mean, any question, literally any question, film, whatever it was, bro, like he was an open book. So I learned so much from him during that time. You know that credit card, the one that you're afraid to look at to see what the balance is? Yep. Well, if you've been avoiding your debt like Tommy, it's time to confront it. Upstart can help you face it and finally pay it all off. Upstart is the fast and easy way to get a personal loan to pay off your debt all online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple, fixed monthly payment. Upstart finds smarter rates with trusted partners because they assess more than just your credit score. For the five minute online rate check, you can see your rate up front for loans from $1,000 to $50,000. And you can get approved the same day and receive funds as fast as one business day. It sounds super easy. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash JJ. That's upstart.com slash JJ. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. 
Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash JJ. Where can you shop Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Rolex, and more iconic luxury brands for up to 90% off retail? The Real Real. It's the most trusted source for authenticated luxury consignment. Discover everything from women's and men's luxury fashion and accessories to fine jewelry, watches, art, and home decor. It's all authenticated by a team overseen by luxury experts. Thousands of new arrivals come in daily. If you're in Chicago, LA, New York, or San Francisco, stop by one of the Real Real stores. Take advantage of curbside pickup and more in-store services like expert repairs and personal styling. Or shop online at therealreal.com and download the app for exclusive features. It's the sustainable way to shop for luxury. Get 20% off select items with the code REAL, R-E-A-L. Plus, new shoppers get $25 off their first purchase. Visit therealreal.com and shop all your favorite luxury brands today. You know, one of the things about Nick's fans, mm. Nick's Twitter, <laughs> they just, they just, they're looking for some hope. Absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're looking <laughs> for some hope, Tommy. Well, so we got to talk about quickly. Yes. Who, who every, everybody from New York is obsessed with. Yeah. Uh, and so I want to talk about him, but then also I wanted to touch briefly just on D Rose mm -hmm. and what you've learned from him so far. Um, because he's another guy who, to JJ's point, you know, has he has perspective. He's seen he's seen all sides of the league. And so he's coming in like with you, you know, with a bunch of younger guys and sort of helping teach them a little bit. Yeah, man. So the thing about Quick, um, that I really like about Quick is uh he stays the same. Um, good game, bad game. He doesn't change, and, and what I mean about what I mean by that is, dude works his butt off. Like uh, he'll, you know, he'll get shots up after the game. He'll be early to the gym. Uh, he'll be late. Like dude works extremely hard. Um, and I don't care who you are as a player, man. You got that type of attitude, mindset. You have a long career. Uh, so he 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 does that, and I, I really like that about Quick. Um, is just his mindset and approach to the game of basketball. Uh, as far as D Rose, man, what I really like about what I really like about Derek is uh he's one, first off, he's an amazing teammate, like a great teammate. Um, extremely unselfish with how he plays the game of basketball. Uh obviously he's comfortable now uh being back with Tibbs and stuff like that. But uh Derek's like an, uh, an extremely person like who holds himself accountable for everything that he does out there on the court. Um, and he always, like, still to this day, man, he still wants to learn and get better. Like, he still works his butt off, still wants to get better. And, uh, I mean, that's a great person to, like, really look up to um, in a sense because, you know, you've been an MVP, you've been through so much in your career, you know, the highs and lows, and to still come in with a fresh, renewed mindset of wanting to lead and get better every day is, like, especially, you know, everything that he's been through is, is pretty cool, so. Uh, I'm learning a lot from Derek, honestly. What was your thought process the first time? Maybe it was training camp. Maybe it was a preseason game, a real game. I don't know. But what was your thought process the first time you saw Emmanuel quickly shoot a 17-foot push shot floater? <laughs> yeah, I still kill him. I still kill him to this day. <laughs> I still kill like, I, It's just so – I don't know if it's, it's Tony Parker. Like, It's just so unorthodox, man, because it's like – He'll have a wide open mid mid range jump shot, and he's not taking it. He's gonna shoot a floater from <laughs> from twenty feet, or he's gonna have like he's a great three point shooter. He's gonna pump fake, and he's gonna get to his floater. And I'm like, bro, if you just don't shoot the damn ball, like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's his shot, man. And he makes it at, at an extremely high rate. Um, you know, it's something that he's extremely comfortable with, uh, comfortable doing, and uh, it's a it's a tough cover, man. Like. You know, for for a guard of his size, especially he gets people on their back and he gets in the lane and he shoots that floater, and it's it's cash. So uh, I can't even hate on him, man. Like he does it at a good a good rate. He does a good job. Of it. Did you have a sense from from your Kentucky crew that this was going to happen? Because it's it seems it seems almost counterintuitive in a way that a guard from Kentucky would be sort of this slept on coming in, especially a first round pick. But yet, you know, with all, and there's been a lot of good rookies this year, so it's not that 
it's not that he doesn't have competition, but like he really has sort of come on the scene and established himself very early. Yeah, I didn't really understand it, man, because he was he played really well at Kentucky, like um, especially his last year, uh, SEC Player of the Year, all that. Like, dude was really good. So I didn't understand why, you know, for one, people were surprised about uh, how he went to twenty five. Honestly, uh, you know, so he was a really good player. I was impressed with him at Kentucky, and I'm obviously. You know, I'm going to show Kentucky guys love regardless. Uh, you know how we roll. But uh, I was I was a little bit surprised. Um, and I didn't really know much about him, honestly, even though they went to Kentucky. But uh, like I said, I was more impressed with uh, and surprised by his work ethic, man. Dude works really hard. Um, it pleases me to know that you guys give him endless shit about his float game. It really does. Because if I was his teammate, <laughs> if I was his teammate, he would hear about it all the time. It's insane, bro. It's, it's a legendary shot. It's just a legendary <laughs> shot. <laughs> it is. It really is crazy. Before we let you go, we've, we've touched on it a little bit earlier, but with all you've been through in your career, what would it mean to you to make the All-Star game this year? Ah, uh, man, it would mean a lot. Uh, you know, like you said, with everything I've been through, uh, the stages in my career, um, and just for me, um, just to persevere, stay with it. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, you know how this league is, man. Like, you can be here a couple of years and you can be right out of it, and people will forget about you, <laughs> and you know, that would be it. Uh, for me, uh, just to stay with it, um, keep improving, getting better every year. Um, nobody expects people to make a, a jump and get better in, in year seven. Like <laughs> nobody, nobody expects that. So for me, uh, like I said, just stay with it, keep getting better, uh, and I just want to keep improving. Um, you know, I, I, I truly love the game of basketball, so I just want to keep improving. And for me to, uh, you know, get that recognition or you know to achieve you know that type of success would mean a lot. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate it. And I don't think it would be a better place to do it. And then, like I said, like we talked about, we've talked about it already, but just to be in New York, being, um, you know, Knicks fans, they, they want, you know, some type of success. You know, they want their team to win. They want, you know, a lot to cheer for. So uh, for it to be here uh, will mean a lot for sure. Well, just so you know, I bought a timeshare on Julius Randall Island um, <laughs> a couple years ago. So yes, I appreciate it. The value of that timeshare is skyrocketing. It's going up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. We we appreciate the time, brother. This was great. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, bro. All right, All right man. man.